So if we, well, labs is, as always, our preview initiative. But uh, the uh, formal meetings at the, at the lecture time, I think, we do today, twice next week, and once uh, following week. And the, after that, I'll probably show up here in the room just in case anyone wants to chat informally, but as soon as you do presentations, you're free. So how do we organize this remaining four, four meetings? So we need to complete a review of uh, time dependent density functional theory. And uh, I will spend maybe complete meeting today and half of the meeting next time. Mm. Coming Tuesday, we will cover, we will finish time dependent density function theory in the same format as we finish all theories that we covered in the past. So we will draw a flowchart. And I'm not sure if you will have time to make a quiz or not because the <laughs> semester is coming to the end. But um, it will be like conversion of ideas of time dependent density theory into algorithmic way uh, to see how does it work in practice. We the length of the course doesn't allow to go into all derivations, but probably you do not uh, consider it very tragic for, for, for the theory. So we'll cover main, main ideas. And um, next, well, this Thanksgiving weekend, or maybe a little below, a little after, is the main time to complete calculations for research project. So it is desired, assumed, expected, wished that by the time we meet in one week, uh, each of us will have sufficient amount of computational data to convert from research activity to scientific communication activity, which also take, takes effort. So last uh, week, we, we will have one more lab to tie the loose ends, but let's plan on completing as much as possible right now. Well, in, in a week from now on. And uh, as you have probably experienced, it takes a little less time than wet lab work. So mostly you just submit jobs in time and then you wait until they are completed. Um, I will be in the Material Modeling Studio today at 5 and tomorrow at 5. You need to <laughs> come just <laughs> once. <laughs> um, so there will be 
very few of new material. Basically, it, it will be an opportunity for one-to-one -one communications for um, catching up your research projects. I may show a little of the integrate uh, analysis of orbitals for identifying church transfer states, but it will be really brief. And uh, I would like to introduce you to well to those who will be able to visit. I will make a brief introduction to the superpower, to the National Energy Resource Resource Computing System, NERST supercomputer that. Uh, I have, I have an ability to open like little accounts for you and if you uh, are tired of the university computer and think it is not sufficiently productive, you have access to something a little quicker. So that there will be guarantee that in the remaining week you complete everything that you want to complete. So that you can complain that resources were not sufficient, therefore here is my journey, through. that's it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay. When we were discussing the formulation of your research projects, there were some one-to-one -one discussions, and there are specifics for each project. For those who are not sure about specifics, for uh, there are some projects that are relatively general. There is a very oversimplified protocol. Take the ground state optimized geometry, change electronic configurations, compare their density of states and spectra, run very high temperature molecular dynamics, take new geometry and explore properties after this heating. Sometimes it leads to completion of some reactions, sometimes it just changes the properties, like it uh, very often closes the gap and makes it absorb in the infrared, but it is just a um, last resort if you do not know what to do. For most of you, you have an idea uh, how to process with your projects. If you're looking into reactions and your reaction is not going in the direction you want, um, one of the opportunities is to explore the reaction in the different, well, for us, we can tell with different total number of electrons, with different oxidation state. But you can convert it onto the language on, of practical wet chemistry, like changing the pH, acidity, or um, like you, whether it is reducing or oxidizing environment. If it is reducing environment, it means that it is an excess of electrons. If it is oxidizing, it is a lack of electrons. And you can model this environment by changing total number of electrons. Sometimes, if you modify it, uh, reactions uh, drastically change their, um, how, they, how they develop. <coughs> Another way to look on it is to see that if your substrate, if your model contains something solid, is connected to bias, to electrode, which is connected to either positive or negative of, of the battery. So there are, there are some ways to analyze change of total number of electrons and look into the reactions. Quick yes, question. yes, yes, please. Is there a way to modify the isotope that we're looking at instead of using hydrogen, use deuterium, for instance? Yes. Okay. Look into the pod cars. Okay. And there should be an available potential for changed mass. You have to change all the masses then? Or just one? No, just one. Um, you take the pod car for. Instead of pot car for hydrogen, you take pot car for deuterium. Okay. So that's a, yeah. so it's a separate. Yes. File. Yes. Yes. It will be named instead of H. Yeah. And if it is not available, you can, can just uh, make a copy of the pot car for hydrogen to your local directory. Do not spoil 
those centralized and uh, find line where it determines the mass. And then in the pass car, do you have to change then the H two D as well, or do you? Well, it, it does. It doesn't matter how it will. It is for your comfort to see, I see. it as appears as better. Okay. You can uh, call instead of like hydrogen and deuterium, you can call them potatoes and apples. The program yeah. will yeah. run the same way. Okay. But um, if you only want to change one, you have to remake your product. Exactly. Yep. Right. That's right. Mm. There are two additional skills that we didn't cover in lab, in labs, but maybe we can postpone it to our last lab meeting. Um, the normal mode analysis, and actually we're running the TDDFT, which is very simple. It uh, goes along with our previous experience with, with Gaussian, just changing one line in the, in the input and uh, making sufficiently small system and having sufficiently large amount of resources. <laughs> um, I am going to distribute something. So hopefully it's not a fire alarm. alarm. Um, So, I am wishing you relaxing and pleasant Thanksgiving weekend. But maybe you feel uh, bored. <laughs> <laughs> and um, right now, I, uh, there are no obligatory homeworks at all. This is just to your entertainment. There are two things that are obligatory, mandatory, those are uh, presentations in two weeks from now and written reports, which will be um, due in a week and two days from now, but you may start thinking on them. And uh, the homework is formulated in such a way that you develop your written reports step by step. But some um, intellectually gifted individuals, without irony, have a talent to do everything in the last hour. If you consider yourself in this category, you don't care about splitting responsibility over several days. <laughs> uh, this is just a little um, guidance that you can take and consider, but uh, judge your own uh, abilities and resources, and I don't care how you get to the point. So, this is optional homework that covers some, introduces some ideas on um, thinking a little bit on the time dependent density function of theory, which just uh, listening to what we will be discussing today. And most of you do not have TDDFT components in your research, so it is just entertainment or investment in, into the future. Then um, there is a little guidance of what to do with your, how to navigate your research if you do not have any ideas. But I think most of you have very clear, you know what to do. And then um, you can start composing your reports even if you do not have results by now, you may formulate uh, a little paragraph or half page, whatever, depending on your uh, mood, telling what is the challenge that you want to address and uh, what is your hypothetical resolution of this, of this challenge. Like, why did you decide to do this, uh, this research? What is unknown and what you want to compute in order to resolve it? And then as time goes, it will go pretty quickly. We will fill those Word documents with a couple of figures and tables, and then a description of what, what we see and how we conclude. So it, uh, final written report will be very short, something that anyone can complete. If 
materials, results available, anyone can complete in maybe an hour. But you may start thinking ahead so that you have less hectic in the last night before before it is due. Um, another so handout for your entertainment that you the one I distributed has some value. You may invest time in looking through. Other two are completely entertaining. If uh, I would be not offended if you put it under the back cover of your notebook and forget about it or use it as Kindle for your uh, fireplace. Um, so first one is six pages from the book by Rich Martin on the uh, time-dependent density functional theory. It doesn't this uh, brief overview doesn't include the rigorous derivation, but it gives the overall context of uh, connection of TDDFT to regular DFT. And some of you may consider TDDFT as a primary tool of your research for several years. So. So this is more in the style of um, good research paper with main statements and comparison on practical uh, examples at, at the end. And some of you who are interested in silicon uh, quantum, dot, quantum dots may appreciate it at most. Um, do not look to exact data because the this is a copy from a book which is not super obsolete, but it is not uh, this year. So uh, they have uh, not the up-to-date functional, they are good just with main trends. Um, another last handout for today is the example of what research, independent research projects in course like this may result into. So uh, this is um, trace of how one of the attendees of such class protests. So it was a project in class, a little seed report, and then in about a couple of months from them, it was growing, adding a little more details, and then it uh, converted into research paper. But it was the first author has experimental background. He never considered himself as a um, theorist or computational expert, but it's just uh, teasing you and showing that uh, there is some possible continuation of your research projects if you are, um, if, if they are going well. And you do recognize some figures that we did as, as the homework, at least the style of the, of the figures, where the uh, anions and cations are um, compared. Okay. So just in case if you just woke up, or if I have just woke up, we are in the computational chemistry for uh, 76 slash 676, meeting number 26. <laughs> we are working on today's functional theory. And uh, our last meeting will be on Tuesday, December 6, two weeks from now, where hopefully everyone will be enthusiastic to make some presentations based on the uh, individual research projects. In case uh, you do not remember what your project, which is very unlikely, 
<laughs> and we have a little two way to set up right now. So um, we do have a, a studies of calcite of the um, electronic probe, which is of metalloporphyrins, the reactions catalyzed by uh, metalloporphyrins, the uh, reactions catalyzed by metal surface for the thiophene. Then uh, we have two research projects about uh, carbon nanotubes, um, chemical etching and use of carbon nanotubes for sensors. Um, and there are another set of projects for the metal semiconductor interface and um, metal clusters and two research areas for uh, very closely related to disensitized solar cells. Electron transfer at the interface of uh, semiconductor and organic dye. So we are finishing the fourth chapter uh, of the course dealing with time dependent density functional theory. We have four meetings more today, next Tuesday, coming Thursday, and then uh, a Tuesday two weeks from now. And we are continuing going over time dependent density functional theory. When we met last time, we did cover a comparison between orbital picture and excitonic picture. And we did set up a framework to deal with excited state theories. We formulated an order, a request, what we as users need from those theories. So any, any theory, any method for excited states should provide a set of transition energies and uh, oscillator strengths that um, for, for users, we can use it as a black box and we can say no matter how, but with a little curiosity, we are looking on the way how those two uh, types of, of parameters are computed. <clears throat> so the primary difference between our approach, our approximate approach that we use in our practical component of the course by now in uh, non-interacting orbital approach to absorption. We are formulating transition dipoles and oscillator strengths on the language of pairs of orbitals. If we are going to the time-dependent density function theory, these two primary characteristics, transition energies and oscillator strengths, are formulated on the language of the density, so-called transition density. Uh, and the main question, it's like a half minute derivation, but main question is how to get transition dipole out of transition density. So if we get an answer to this question, then we are free to go. I'm just looking for time. Um, and meanwhile, there will be some more or less useful, useful things. So the answer will be on the last slide. And this panel will progress as, as we go slide by slide. Um, before we go to the sweet spot that we really need, I will make a couple of comments that may be of a little curiosity or value for your research projects. Uh, please give me a secret sign if, uh, like, little hand waving, if this picture doesn't um, bring any memories in you. Okay, then give me an open sign if this picture gives you some uh, memories. Okay. So, when we are playing with 
evaluating the electronic structure of our materials, we do not take into account quantized vibrations, and we, we never will in this course, because the course ends soon. And uh, it is a frequent mistake to forget about nuclear reorganization, which is very OK for solids, for dielectrics, for oxides, but it is very not OK for soft uh, molecules. And this uh, image summarizes this idea so that if we are looking onto optical properties of a material, then we should take into account then upon perturbation by light, the material, the molecule can experience substantial change in the geometry. So what we are typically exploring, we are considering, so here the all geometry of a molecule is projected just on one coordinate, and what we are exploring is this uh, blue line. So we are looking on transitions between electronic states for geometry corresponding to um, neutral ground optimized state. But um, if we need to estimate ability of a molecule to emit light, then it is frequently needed to evaluate the geometry that uh, the molecule takes upon photo excitation. So in our oversimplified methodology, in all our oversimplified modeling, it would mean to set up the Fermi weight key in the VASP and let it optimize. So then it will bring to the uh, position that corresponds to excited state. Same for um, anions, cations, and magnetic states. As zero order approximation, we can keep unchanged geometry and explore different electronic configurations. But typically, if you tweak something with the electronic configuration, it will change the geometry, it will re reconfigure. And if one wants to be more precise, it could be reasonable to optimize upon any change of the configuration. Uh, since we are limited in time, one can do exploration only at the ground state geometry, but just uh, properly uh, label it and tell that one may anticipate that geometry will change further if one optimizes. because. Some of the systems are big, and uh, our even if today we will get an access to supercomputers, still one week is not, not a very long time. How does one quantitatively explore this uh, difference? Well, one can look for excitation energy from let's say, homo to homo in the ground state, and then the homo to homo gap at the geometry corresponding to excited state, and uh, their difference will, difference of this red and blue line will be what spectroscopists call uh, Stokes shift. So primarily goal of this is uh, nuclear reconfiguration. So one may estimate the uh, value of this uh, stock shift for the models that, that we treat. Um, also, there is a comment that um, I always wanted to give but may have forgotten. The difference of orbitals energies is the lowest possible weather step in the precision. If we are limited in the resources and we cannot go to advanced theories, but we want to increase precision a little bit, then the much more preferred way to get trustable energies is to compute total energies only. So instead of looking on the orbital transition, you create necessary electronic configuration, like excited, anionic, cationic, and then you compute the difference of total energy for the changed 
configuration and ground state configuration. This um, results turn to coincide with experiment much better. And you may, if you're cur curious, you may explore how the orbital energy difference compares with difference in, in total energies. And uh, if you are exposed to spectroscopy of uh, organic dyes, you know that absorption and emission spectra may differ substantially. Because of this uh, nuclear reconfiguration, and uh, <laughs> this is not an organic dye, it's something different. But uh, this is general. Um, feature that is observed in, in, in many materials. And also, in spectroscopy of organic molecules, uh, one often see the vibrational progression that we will not get in the method that we are doing right now, because our nuclei are not quantized. So if you know for sure that there are uh, progression, we will see only zero zero transition in what we are doing right now. If one critically needs this uh, vibronic progression, then one needs a little different methods. Th they are available, but not in this uh, limited uh, time frame. Um, so before we get to our sweet point, here is a little scattered comments, but they can be available for, you, for your research. So some of you have identified your interests as being related to charge transfer. <laughs> and we all can characterize our model by finding contram orbitals, which are building blocks for total density. They are not uh, highly trustable things. They are just basis to compute something real. But substantial insight and understanding of the systems can be obtained by analyzing spatial distributions of orbitals. Each orbital takes a lot of space on the disk. Each orbital takes uh, a little exhausting effort of humans to draw. Even if you use some scripts, just looking on it. If uh, you have a relatively big system and you have a couple of hundreds orbitals, you just watching them one after another, you, you need to sleep or take a coffee and uh, have some rest. So, but sometimes we need to identify if the model exhibit properties for charge transfer. Sometimes one looks on the pairs of lowest excitation, home low orbital, if they are localized in different special areas, areas of space. And if they do, one, one tells, good, it's photo-induced charge transfer, good for photocatalysis, good for photovoltaics, whatever. But many systems have lowest transition neutral without charge transfer, although they are able to exhibit useful charge transfer properties for the higher excitations. So one may need to screen more than one excitation to find charge transfer states. And uh, there are several ways to do it. One is to compute, not transition, but regular dipole for each orbital and see where the center of this charge distribution is whether it is coincided with center of mass of molecule or it is shifted. One way. Another is to, oh, another is to project the three-dimensional charge density on one selected axis. And then this three-dimensional picture will convert into one-dimensional, and one probably can plot all hundreds orbitals at once and just see whether there are heroes among them that uh, do not follow the general trend and have maxima in specific, uh, in some exotic regions of space. So it's just integrating the three-dimensional charge distribution over x and y, and we will quickly do it uh, when we meet in, in the lab. So this is, this could be interesting to those who are interested in charge transfer. So like if we have special distribution in one area, one can integrate 
and c over x and y and see that in z it has peak here. If it is distributed in, in different area, can be integrated and see that it is in different area. So pairs of orbitals with different localization of charge. Uh, question. Yes, please. How is, do you, then do you sum along the z-axis? No, you, you, you sum along x and y, and you keep z untouched. So it was like taken as twice, where z equals constant, mm -hmm. and adding together all values of densities. But then what does that give you? Dependence on z. Uh, if you have big inhomogeneity along x and y, it, it is not the best. But if you know for sure that your model is aligned along z-axis, this can give additional degree of freedom for good analysis. Um, one thing that we are not covering because of lack of time is uh, so-called partial density of states, the distribution of orbitals over uh, atomic orbitals, which is not a bad skill. and. Uh, we can cover it individually after the course ends, maybe on the last informal meeting. OK, so here is the summary. It is the uh, last slide that we had on the, on the blackboard before we left, right? Something like this. So if you need transition dipole, we compute it as the expectation value of the position operator between pair of contram orbitals. And it is not a scalar. It is a vector consisting of three components. So if you need the square of transition dipole, we need each of them square. And it is typically used as an input for oscillator strengths. And it is, assumes the isotropic distribution of all molecules or isotropic distribution of uh, observers. Like uh, there is one molecule and a million of scientists who look from different angles. Uh, probably an ensemble of molecules is easier to imagine. Um, so here are the constants that we all were looking for. And it's a little challenge to, to memorize. So it has um, the Oscillator strength is proportional to the square of transition dipole and the energy of transition. Transition frequency. The rest are uh, elementary con con constants: mass of electron, charge of electron, and Planck constant. And if we are doing things in uh, atomic system of units, then those become one, and the equation becomes simpler. So the uh, phi cancels, and it becomes the only significant factors are transition dipole square and transition energy. So by plugging in couple of elementary constants one can get from the dimensionless transition oscillator strengths to the Einstein coefficients of spontaneous emission and induced absorption and induced emission, A and B coefficients. So they are also formulated in terms of transition dipole and uh, oscillator strengths. So if we need to estimate the excited state lifetime, then we take inverse of oscillator strengths, wrap it up with uh, few more elementary constants and the um, transition energy squared, and then we get to the lifetime. So there is a version of the uh, code for transition dipole in our repository that we use that adds additional column in the oscillator strength file and reports the lifetime in uh, picoseconds or nanoseconds. 
So for each transition between each pair of orbitals, we have a quick way to estimate lifetime of, of excited states. Uh, why excited states do not live eternally? Where energy is going to? Why it is dissipated? Although we, we are skipping derivations, but what is the basic answer? Like, why? Huh? Fluctuations. Fluctuations of what? Um, if you if we suppose a hypothetical universe where ions are absolutely frozen with no vibrations of ions, would the excited state live eternally, or it will have finite lifetime? Perturbation by nuclear vibrations is no, no longer, no, right. but nuclear nuclear vibrations are nuclear degrees of freedom, and they are they would be responsible for non-radiative lifetime, for non-emissive transitions. But here, emission it means that electronic degrees of freedom interact with what? There is no trap. If we had only molecule, excited molecule, and then after it emits, we have a ground state molecule and yeah, quantum of light. And light, what is light? Yes. Um, what is light if inside your laser? It's just a sim simpler question. If you do have a laser, which means like two mirrors and some junk between. It's propagating, but um, there is a standing wave, standing wave of uh, electromagnetic field. And this standing wave has different amplitudes. And even if we are at zero Kelvin, even if ions are not moving, the electromagnetic degrees of freedom have zero oscillation. Same as in harmonic oscillator, the uh, ground state uh, has one half h nu. And interaction of electronic degrees of freedom with this ground state oscillations of electromagnetic field are responsible for spontaneous emission. So even if our ions are nailed for freezed completely, there will be a spontaneous emission. And we can compute it. Precise or not precise, it's a second question. But uh, we can estimate and qualitatively say that, okay, this pair of states, this excitation will be long cleaving, and this one will quickly go away. So that's assuming that you have additional perturbation after you are in the excited state. The zero oscillations of electromagnetic field are always existing around us. We are not alone. <laughs> Electromagnetic <laughs> waves follow us. And they exert a perturbation on electronic degrees of freedom that lead to spontaneous emission if they are thinking that they are too, too good to be, in the, to be excited. So everything will dump sooner or later. Good. So we do have width in our equations for absorption spectra that uh, take into account non-zero vibrations, some, some vibrations of nuclear degrees of freedom that we describe by Gaussian functions. We do have oscillator strengths, and we do have transition energy as difference between elementary pairs of orbitals in our old style, in the orbital picture. When we go to the excited state, uh, excitonic picture, we will have these two pairs of uh, data, two this uh, kinds of data set computed from different types of equations. Okay, we will recover this. Total energy in one geometry and another geometry. 
Oops. So where the time-dependent density function theory comes from? It comes from the fact that ground state molecule is perturbed by light which in our um, dipole approximation, which we uh, discussed last time, can be approximated as oscillating electric field. There is a distribution in space, there is a magnetic component, but they are negligible if you are looking on uh, objects of, of the order of one nanometer. So if we do have oscillating electric field applied to charge density to cloud of electrons to the charge. Electric field applied to charge makes charge to move. And if it is moves as a, as a whole, then we have a plasmonic mechanism of excitation. So all charge density moves inside the system with uh, the frequency determined by light. This is good for macroscopic or like uh, nanoscale plus systems of uh, several of 100 nanometers. If you're looking on the molecular size, there is, instead of continuous energies, there are discrete energies. And instead of moving of the electron density as a whole, as, a, as, as all together, the exertion of electric field promotes transitions between orbitals. So we are looking on the response of our electronic system to perturbation by periodic electric field. Right? So no one objects. Probably it's time to go to the blackboard. energy that we can formulate as Hamiltonian that are self-consistently satisfy each other. But now we are modifying our Hamiltonian by additional terms, H prime, which can be our original Hamiltonian minus interaction with electric field in the dipole approximation. Keep your, your feet. No, no, no. Oh, I'll, I'll use this. Keep, keep your feet on. I, I'm oh. not a fan. Oh. So, suppose <laughs> I'm electric field. I have a frequency of maybe one revolution per second. Then I apply it to the molecule. What will be the frequency of the revolution of uh, everything that is connected to it? It will be one. Yes. But it will have a phase factor. Probably. Phase factor, but it will be the same frequency. If the perturbation has specific frequency, then the response to perturbation will have the same frequency. If you have sudden, if I come and kick it, then there will be all frequencies. But if I'm persistently for infinitely long time perturbed at the same frequency, then everything will come into quasi-stationary state and everything will be changing with the same frequency. So we can assume very logically there, there is no big gap that our density will start depending on time. And if you have the amplitude of vibrations and the time-dependent, so the density will get 
time-dependent contribution. So it will, it will change uh, with time. And the same frequency as the inducing factor. Resonance. <laughs> so, if uh, how do you call this device? Swing. Swing. <laughs> so, if you try to in. Um, Increase the amplitude of oscillations on a swing. You need to, and you are a swinger. You need to apply perturbation with some specific frequency. If you start moving more frequently or less frequently, uh, you will get no big amplitude motion. So the response, response of system. Perturbation is maximal at resonance frequency. Okay, goes along with common sense. So here is amplitude of the response. So we are probing our electronic system by perturbation at different frequency. And we are exploring at which frequency the amplitude of this response will be maximized. So basically, we put inducing frequency as the x-axis argument and the amplitude of the response as, as y. And then we can make a Experiment in our minds, Gidan can experiment. When we are changing frequency and see at this frequency there is response, and this there is, and this there is not. And we need to find frequencies omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, at which response is maximal, and we may want to find the values of this response rho 1, rho 2, rho 3, at, uh, that correspond to the perturbation at given frequency. Objections? Whew. Then you know what time dependent density function of theory is. The rest are just boring mathematical details. So it is a response system, a response uh, theory. Response of electronic system to optical perturbation. So how, how is it uh, formulated practically? So the increment of total energy if you perturb with given frequency by quantum laws will be h bar omega. And then we are looking for the amplitude of the response. And this response, this change in density due to transitions, would be logical to call transition density. So we are looking for transition density as function of, of omega. So a little summary of what uh, we discussed right now and what we started in our previous meeting. 
So we do have modified Hamiltonian, perturbed Hamiltonian. We do have modified density. And I would like to write something on the blackboard. Just one, maybe one equation. find several orders of perturbation. Um, those first order will be linear in the intensity of uh, amplitude of electric heat. The second one will be quadratic in the electric field. And one can go further. Right? In this, at the small amplitude of perturbation, we do not go, we do not need to go higher than the first order. When we are going to the first order of perturbation theory, we are allowed to make to change only one of the Modify only one of the orbitals, either either one or another one. If we are going to the second order, then we can perturb both. And the message is that if we are staying within first order of perturbation theory, we do not have simultaneous change of both orbitals. Therefore, we do not affect the segment of the density matrix that corresponds to occupations. In uh, So the density matrix is composed of four segments, one for occupied, one for unoccupied, and two for uh, cross terms. In the ground state, we have ones here on the diagonal, zeros here on the off-diagonal. If we are in the second order of perturbation theory, we will be able to modify occupations. But if we are staying within the first order of perturbation theory, we have modification only of this of diagonal terms. If you want more details, it would take several hours of derivation. I'm trying to, to condense. So in the first order perturbation, only of diagonal parts of density matrix are perturbed. So let's call these blocks of density matrix X and Y. You can call anything by any name you like. And then we know that the diagonal parts will not change, but this off-diagonal change will 
experience some, some change. So the main question of time-dependent density, uh, density functional theory is to see response of this x and y, of the off diagonal parts of the density matrix to the periodic perturbation. Response of the off diagonal terms in density matrix into periodic perturbation. And as you have seen in the little diagram on the uh, back, on the lower part of, of our uh, blackboard, those amplitudes, they are not time dependent. Time dependence is gone because we know that all oscillations will go on with the same frequency as an inducing factor. So we need only the amplitudes which are frequency dependent, not time dependent. So from now on, we forget about time dependence and we have time dependence only in the name of the theory. Okay? So we need this X and Y. And then we go from orbital picture to excitonic picture that we discussed prior. So there is equation derived by scientist with uh, last name Casida that formulate uh, this problem on the language of eigenvalue problem. So those x and y are off diagonal parts of density matrix. And they are written as a vectors. You, you can, matrix is set of numbers. And you can just take them one by one and write into the vector. So you take this x and y, write them into a vector, formulate the appropriate superoperator, and set it up as an uh, eigenvalue equation for transition energy. So this will be an equation that will have solutions only at those frequencies omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, when the system exhibits maximal response to external perturbation. The frequencies correspond to where uh, this response is, and the x and y are amplitudes of this response. Uh, it may sound, you may observe a little lack of logic because it's not a complete story. One derives this equation, equations uh, continuously with Fourier transform as, and with perturbation theory, but for our purposes, we just skimming through. Equation for this x and y. What are these elements of the superoperator? If our if the Cassidy equation gives answers as a transition energies, then in the zeroth order, those uh, super operator is just diagonal with energy difference, orbital energy difference. And if you remove everything else, the Cassidy equation we will produce results in the orbital picture. What are additional terms? Same as in all, all our quantum chemistry approaches. There is a Coulomb term. And uh, there is an uh, exchange and correlation from density functional. But since we are looking not on the ground state density by transition, it is a second order of the total energy exchange correlation component in response to the variation of density. So second, very, um, second functional derivative. So if someone asks you what is a super operator in Cassidy equation, you can briefly answer this second functional derivative of total energy in respect to density. So the diagonal blocks are not affected and off diagonal blocks are affected. So if we solve Cassidy equation, which is implemented in, in many codes, then we will get frequencies and we, we will have values of the density matrix elements for this uh, uh, off-diagonal terms, transition density matrix. So the last question, and I think today will be the only time when plan matches the allowed time. So what if we do have 
density and we do have operator. How to find expectation value of the uh, transition dipole? So we will, what are we doing? We need set of transition energies and we need set of oscillator strengths. But now we formulate everything in terms of density. How to find expectation value if we do not have wave function, if we have only density or density metrics. and make a simplest possible example I am considering only the transition between home and womb then our all transition density metrics will be represented by one element here one element there and then we do have matrix elements of the transition dipole moment. Typically, it is zero for transition from homo to homo and homo to homo. And we are taking, let's say, only x component, although it is a vector. So, in case we do have operator and density, the procedure to find expectation value is formulated as multiply these two matrices and take trace of those. Right? So, here is the matrix uh, of transition dipole moment which means that we have found expectation values for transition between each individual orbital and here are the uh, density matrix elements that in this specific case come out from TDD DFT calculations now I am going to Practice row by column multiplication. So row by column. And to skip all these indices, I will write on the D character. So zero times row comma comma. Row by column. Plus D times row comma comma. Here, zero times zero comma comma plus t times zero comma comma. No errors yet. Next row by column. D times row comma comma plus zero times row comma comma. And the last one. This row by this column. D Times rho comma comma, which is y in our traditional matrix. 
Non, 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 So the trace means that we forget whatever was on the diagonal and we take some of the diagonal elements. D times rho gamma gamma plus D rho gamma gamma. So one was x, another was y. So matrix element of transition, x plus y. Right now, our matrices are reduced just to one element because we are looking for one transition. If we are looking for more rich uh, spectrum, you have more. But you see that as soon as we do have elements of transition density matrix, we do have a procedure to compute expectation values of transition type of element. So from transition density matrix, we are getting transition dipole moment expectation value. And then you can use it to find oscillator strengths. Oscillator strengths. Make sense? I think it is same as, as here. So we didn't fail on the on the board by multiplying matrices two by two. So it is a procedure to get observables out of density rather than orbitals. Okay, we are finishing maybe a couple of minutes below time, but so when we were working in the orbital representation. Our absorption spectra were collection of uh, resonances at the offsets of energy between initial and final orbital with amplitudes coming from oscillator strengths that also computed from, from orbitals. When we are in the excitonic picture, we again have a set of resonances where these transition energies come from the poles from solutions of Casida equation and the uh, oscillator strengths come from uh, expectation values of uh, transition dipole computed with transition density metrics. So time-dependent density functional theory is another tool to compute absorption spectra, considered more reliable and of higher precision. Guess what will be on the next slide? <laughs> okay, well, um, can I expect someone to come today? So if, uh, if you plan to, especially if you plan to travel to Thanksgiving holiday, then consider coming today. If you stay in Fargo, but, well, I will be coming twice. Just wait, I will wait, whatever, 20 minutes. If no one shows up, I will go and relax. <laughs> if someone shows, you will go forward. Um, meeting is dismissed. Let's. Um... You're free to go. <laughs>